right. How's everyone doing today? I've got about 13 minutes, and I've got a really difficult question that we have to answer. Can Bitcoin succeed without another soft fork? I'm going to be giving a disclaimer. I am not qualified to answer this, but we're going to get we're going to give it a, we're going to give it a go. So the answer to that question is it depends. We actually it depends on what your definition of success is, and we're going to present some different points of view throughout the next like 12 minutes of this talk. So kind of what I'm covering is like an intro, some use cases, some data that kind of explains the current state of things and kind of why the answer to that original question is it depends. So really quick about me, my name's Giannis. I do research on Bitcoin L2s and yeah, I like things like rollups and different types of solutions that can enable like private Bitcoin payments. Um, disclaimer, not an expert, so if I say anything wrong, you can yell at me on Twitter, that's totally fine. I yell at people all the time, so maybe I deserve to get some back. So if I say anything wrong, at me on Twitter and I can clear it up. So, first, what's a soft fork? So it's essentially a way that we can change Bitcoin and it's backwards compatible, and kind of what that means is it ensures that nodes who have not upgraded their software to adopt the soft fork can remain on the same blockchain as those that have uh, kind of adopted the fork. So that's what a soft fork is. In the context of this discussion, we're talking about it as a way to change Bitcoin. And what are we trying to change about Bitcoin? Well, potentially trying to add more functionality to Bitcoin script. So what's Bitcoin script? It's essentially a scripting language, for lack of a better term, the execution environment that, that dictates the rules that transactions have to be, abide by to be considered valid transactions. And it's intentionally limited, so it's not really expressive like other scripting languages used in other blockchains. And that lack of expressiveness is a feature because it can, you know, prevent kind of things like malicious forms of MEV and things of that nature. So it's intentionally limited. Um, it's really hard to build expressive contracts on Bitcoin. And yeah, so that's, that's what Bitcoin script is. So what do we mean by limited, right? So for example, there's no future spending constraints, so I can't restrict the way that a Bitcoin will be spent in the future. Um, we can't do native proof verification, so I can't verify something called a zero knowledge proof or a validity proof within a single Bitcoin script that fits in the block size limit um, due to like the limitations and the scripting capabilities. And the, con the contracts that we can build on chain are not really expressive and they're typically limited to like two party contracts, so like DLCs, lightning channels, state chain multisigs, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so there's this kind of, if you go on Twitter, a lot of developers would agree that Bitcoin scripting language is limited and more flexibility could improve the application space. So building applications on Bitcoin. So like, what do we mean by that? Um, let's go through some examples. First, these, like we talked about on the CTV panel, vaults. So we can build things like vaults today by doing these huge pre-signed transactions to like emulate them. But if we add CTV, we can decrease the complexity and make it a lot more user friendly and give users the ability to just dictate um, the way that UTXOs can be spent in the future, add like a safety, like a safety feature, like if, if you wanna have like a fallback undo button, um, CTV makes this a lot easier and reduces the complexity to build these things to make it easier for users. Things like L2s, um, like ARC, where users have to come on periodically to join in something called a batch output transaction to maintain custody of their funds, CTV can limit some of the interactivity requirements and make it easier for users to participate in these types of transactions. Rollup bridges. Uh, Rollups work today on Bitcoin. They exist. Um, and we can rely on things like BitVM that give us this like permissioned one of n uh, assumption, but it's still a federation in the sense that it's not anybody can participate. And this becomes much better if we have something like Opcat, where we can have state carrying covenants and things like called native proof verification. So we can use an on-chain smart contract to verify the state of the L2 system instead of relying on a kind of permission system that executes that off-chain. And then things like Bitcoin staking, um, which are now being used today to help secure some L2 networks, they work today. You can enter into Bitcoin staking scripts but because you're working with a, a, pre, a, a CTV emulation committee, malicious stakers can actually com collude with the committee signers to avoid slashing. And CTV can better and like enforce programmatic slashing into Bitcoin staking. So those are just some examples. There's tons of them. John Light and some others have built this great site that goes over kind of the soft work use cases. They're really, comp they're really, I guess, complicated and hard to explain in 10 minutes. So check that site out. It's called bitcoin.softworks.org if you want to learn more about the different types of apps that we could build. 
so this sounds amazing. Like, why aren't we going to add all these fancy opcodes to like verify snarks and do better Bitcoin staking and improve a lot of the sub assumptions with self custody? Social consensus is just really, really, really hard. People want different things. Rollups want snark verification. People building potentially on Arc want different types of opcodes. So these conflicting wants between different application teams mean that ev means that everyone in the space has different priorities. And now we're getting into a situation where nation states and institutions and everybody are coming into the space. So we kind of have this last point where we might, this might be the last time that we can actually kind of coordinate a upgrade to the Bitcoin protocol. And failure to move on that right now means that we're closer to ossification. And I would recommend that we don't do that. And I'm going to present some data as to why. But before we get there, there's also this other consideration that the knock-on effects of doing a soft fork um, could, yeah, they, there's maybe unintended consequences. So for example, if we in implement something like Opcat, are we able to build expressive enough scripts to introduce things that by a product of that do things like Mevil, where there's, which can increase minor centralization? What if we coordinate this huge effort for these applications and then there's this massive lack of adoption and it kind of feels like, well, that was a waste of time and we could have spent it better elsewhere. And we also have to like contend with all these different proposals, like which fork is the right one and which kind of roadmap for scaling Bitcoin is the better one to go with. So there's like all these com competing interests and people and everything. So what if we don't fork? So what if we cannot agree on those applications earlier? What if we can't agree which one is best and we kind of stay as is? The answer to that is we just simply accelerate today's Bitcoin adoption. I guess I have a question. Who's ever bought something with Bitcoin? I guess I have a question. Who's ever bought something with Bitcoin? Not a lot of people. It's, it's really fun, right? Like, it's really cool. I think people should do it more. You should try it out today. But what people will do is they'll just use custodial applications. They'll onboard into, if they want to use Bitcoin for payments, they'll onboard into things like eCash. If they just want to hold it, they'll hold it in Coinbase or an ETF. And so we're just going to have custodians kind of actually holding all the Bitcoin on behalf of people, which kind of defeats the purpose, but that's fine. Companies will start buying more Bitcoin and they'll drive up the price and we'll have institutional adoption. That comes on trade-offs. The number probably keeps going up and we all make a lot more money relative to the fiat currencies we're supposed to be trying to escape. But, and we, by a consequence of that, are starting to lose P2P Bitcoin payments and adoption, self-custody, etc. And less people are going to be able to equip to do that. Um, so if you kind of look at some of the data behind this, like the, the Bitcoin ETFs and their on-chain holdings are like exceeding 1, 1 million Bitcoins. That's quite a bit. This is how normal people are now being onboarded into it. If you look at kind of Bitcoin L2s, the majority, all of these are the biggest, um, these things on the right are all the biggest Bitcoin wrappers that people use on different blockchains. They're all completely custodial. Um, the people using Bitcoin on Ethereum and different types of blockchains actually don't custody the real Bitcoin and all of these asset issuers can steal the money unilaterally and have no kind of penalty against them if they wanted to. And then these are, these are all the uh, treasuries, um, the companies now buying Bitcoin in their treasuries. So the kind of issue with this and the byproduct is that these people are facilitating a lot of economic value. So in practice, they hold some type of influence in the network and they're called economic nodes. And what they're doing is they can, they can kind of sway these discussions and because their business model relies on them providing these custodial services, they have an incentive um, to potentially kind of block proposals that make Bitcoin easier to use in a self-custodial form. So the top holders of Bitcoin, if you look at this at Strategy, IBIT, which is an ETF issuer, Fidelity, Grayscale, Tether, uh, Bitco WPTC, which is a custodial wrapped Bitcoin, and, and more centralized institutions. So now we're getting a lot harder. So now we have this social consensus problem. Now we're involving governments and large institutions and custodial wrappers, like I mentioned, that have a business incentive to potentially not allow people to use Bitcoin in a self-custodial way, i.e. 
Coinbase CBBTC is really good for Coinbase's business model and having like a trustless roll up on Bitcoin would be bad for them because users might prefer that over the custodial option and then they'll use ado lose adoption and lose fees, et cetera. And there's varying success metrics, so it depends what we want. Like, do we just want the number to go up? Do we just want people to make more money in fiat holding Bitcoin? Is it like an inflation hedge or digital gold that doesn't move? Are people less incentivized to use it as money? And does its peer-to-peer -peer cash usage kind of drop off? So I'm going to provide like a couple of examples as to why these don't always have to be like conflicting interests. So if you have something like Bitcoin staking, um, if you do commit, if you add like CTV, for example, this is actually a lot more attractive for L2s. So for Bitcoin staking to work, there needs to be an application demand on the other side. So the fees that these applications generate are paid to the stakers for their security. So there's like two two way side of it. And so there's more customers now because if we have this committee list Bitcoin staking, for example, um, the, the applications now know that if someone's malicious, they'll get slashed and they'll get penalized. So does the stronger guarantee create more custom or customers for staking? And then does that generate more revenue for the stakers? So this idle Bitcoin that institutions are holding can now be used in protocols to help secure layer twos um, and provide more economic security to them and stronger guarantees. And in return, these layer twos are incentivized to use that because there's a business case. So for example, if you use Bitcoin staking, an exchange might trust the finality of the stake um, at a station versus waiting for an on-chain confirmation, which is a better user experience. And if there's more money, then there's more of an incentive to do things like this. I'm gonna skip ARC because I think something there's incorrect. Um, and then there's another thing where you have trust minimized L2s. So you have this kind of other flywheel. You know, degeneracy, on-chain degeneracy um, is not really, like Bitcoin has really slow block time. So maybe trading like meme coins on Bitcoin isn't great. And people get annoyed by that and they call it spam. So let's take that off chain and give people like a similar L1 custody assumption in an L2 environment. The app devs can make money because they're running sequencers and can accrue value. And then the fees will still go to miners because to build a trust minimized L2, we need to post the data to Bitcoin. That's like a requirement of that. So we can still put transactions on Bitcoin that pay fees to miners. And we kind of have this like the, 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 the DGENs get what they want, the app devs get what they want, and the miners are still getting paid. So these are like some examples that kind of show that doing a soft fork to provide these more self-custodial options is not necessarily at conflict with kind of maybe more institutional kind of uh, providers. So that's there. So and then improve self-custody, obviously. So if we have more people on chain and more people doing transactions, they can leverage these apps. They can drive revenue to the capital allocators and staking instances. You can drive revenue to the miners who need to be incentivized to keep to keep um securing the network, and you can kind of create this flywheel. More and more people are using Bitcoin, they're using it in more secure environments, they're using it in better apps, and we have a more sustainable ecosystem in the long term. So what is success? It's been a weird year, um, so if you kind of remember last year, there was like tons of interest in like Bitcoin L2s and doing all this stuff. You can actually, there's only two protocols in production that you can consider them to be L2s. One is called Spark, the other is called the Lightning Network. So we actually haven't seen kind of acceleration in that regard. Um, the, but the price has gone up 75%, but as a consequence of people doing less things on chain, we only have this one, like fees are very, very low, and we can kind of see the number of Bitcoin that's going into treasury companies and ETFs and everything is just continuing to accelerate upwards. So again, it's kind of like this, these like two conflicting things, right? So there is no answer. There is no answer to if we soft work Bitcoin or not, is it going to be successful? But what I will say is that if you're interested in using Bitcoin as peer-to-peer -peer cash in online internet markets and kind of in-person retail transactions, a soft fork is going to make that a lot easier and incentivize better applications and better and more developers to come build on Bitcoin. So it just depends on what you want, and that's it. Thank you guys so much. If you have any questions, feel free to find me over there.